Good evening, everyone. Hi, welcome to New Canaan Library. I'm Susan LaPerla, for those of you who don't know me, and I'm serving as the interim co-director of New Canaan Library at this time, and it is my pleasure to welcome you and our guest author, Amor Tolls, to, to the library tonight. Really excited that he's here with us. And we're also pleased that Elm Street Books is co-sponsoring this event, and they are here tonight. If you'd like to purchase a copy of the book and have Amor sign it at the end of the program. Well, we, this book was published in what, June? June 26, 2011. Library bought a copy, bought a few more copies, then a few more copies, and since then, in that short period of time, this book has gone out more than 300 times, which means it's been in constant circulation since we purchased the book. So that's an amazing book that can do that. So why is it so amazing? Well, it's a story full of the romance and glory days of 1930s New York, and it's a fascinating tale of social inclusion and social climbing. Toll's debut novel captures the era of limousines and champagne until dawn, and promises to be fulfilled as heroine Katya, who grew up in Brooklyn, becomes Katie in her quest for all-American inclusion. Through wit, charm, and a serendipitous boom in the, in the economy as World War II approaches, Katie's career takes off and a chance meeting with a handsome banker, Tinker Gray, sets off a chain of events that go on to shape the rest of her life. As Katie moves into the lifestyle she coveted, that of country clubs, elegant dinners, and confidence that wealth and position grant. She comes to realize that promising choices don't always lead to the life one seeks. Amor Tolls was born and raised just out of, outside of Boston. He's a graduate of Yale University and holds an MA in English from Stanford University. He's a principal at an investment firm in Manhattan where he lives with his wife and children. Rules of Civility is his first novel. Please join me in welcoming Amor to New Canaan Library. Good evening, and uh, uh, thank you for having me to New Canaan. Thank you for coming out tonight on a lovely night where you should all be in your backyards, I'm sure. Um, I, I was raised in Boston, and I moved to New York in 1989 when I was about 25 years old. And when I first arrived in the city, I lived uh, with a childhood friend of mine in an illegal sublet uh, in the East Village, right next door to the New York City headquarters of the Hells Angels. And at the time, this was known as the safest block in New York, for <laughs> obvious reasons. Um, but one morning, uh, shortly after arriving in New York City, a Saturday morning, uh, I was going into the Lower East Side to pick up uh, breakfast for the two of us. And as I went along Houston Street, an older man in dark clothing uh, with a beard, he stopped me and he says, excuse me, but are you the sort of person who, when you meet a person who needs help, that you would help this person? And I thought, well, that's a hell of a question. Um, but, you know, I was sort of in my head, I'm thinking, you know, I'd like to think I'm the sort of person who might help a stranger in need. So I said, sure, you know, what, what can I do for you? And he said, good, good, come this way, come this way. So there in the corner of Houston Street is this little two-story gray nondescript building. Uh, I, must have been, I must have passed it, uh, you know, a thousand times without even noticing it. And uh, he leads me in the building, and then we go uh, down a, a narrow staircase into the basement. Now, this must have been before I saw Silence of the Lambs, because <laughs> I don't know what I was thinking, but uh, nonetheless, I followed the gentleman down the stairs, and there in the basement, uh, we, we discover there are two very long tables uh, covered with food, surrounded uh, with men, women, and children in the dark. Now, what this turned out to be was an Orthodox uh, synagogue, and in the, the Orthodox Jewish tradition, uh, the Sabbath, Saturday, is honored by doing no labor, and uh, their interpretation of that is to include the uh, prohibition against using electronic devices of any kind. So the tradition in the Orthodox community is you turn your lights on on Friday night and you leave them on, um, so they're ready for you on Saturday. Now, someone had carelessly turned the lights off on Friday night, and so the congregation has found themselves in this situation, um, gathered because in the dark, because in addition, 
Uh, the strict interpretation of these rules by the Orthodox community has a prohibition uh, of, of, uh, of asking somebody for help as well. Um, so having led me down the stairs, this, this gentleman, in this terrifically roundabout way, starts to say, as you go around the room, if you see a string hanging from the ceiling, and you are curious as to the purpose of this string, you should explore your curiosity. You know? <laughs> so I'm getting the picture. I'm like, oh, okay, okay I get it. So, so and as I'm going you know, around exploring my curiosity with the strings, these young men are jumping off of benches and saying, no, no, what are you doing? He mustn't do that. And the old man is saying, no, it's okay. Go with God. Go with God. Um, now, uh, 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 shortly thereafter, about a, about a year later, I was uh, dating the woman who is now my wife. And I, I think in the, in the way of, of young people everywhere, um, we would celebrate the anniversary of our first date. You know, you're not married yet, so date one. That's what you celebrate as an anniversary. And uh, for us at the time, the go-to spot was the Union Square Cafe, which I'm sure many of you know uh, well in the city. And the Union Square Cafe, for 20 years has been a, a very popular uh, spot in, in, in town, and for good reasons, because it is, it's got terrific food, but it's not overly precious or pretentious. It's very welcoming. Um, it's, it's pricey, but not super expensive. Now, now, it was over our heads, but of course, that's the point, right? It's your anniversary. You're supposed to save up some money, get in your best clothes, and go. So we arrive at the restaurant, and the maitre d' is taking us to sort of one of these uh, tables for two, or sort of these tables for two along uh, a wall. Um, and as we're approaching our table, I see that there's a, a roughly 60-year-old man uh, sitting in a, uh, at the table right next to where we're headed. He's by himself. And I recognize him. He uh, was the father of a friend of mine from graduate school. And um, I had met him on one or two occasions, you know, with his, his child. And uh, at the time, he was something of a figure in New York. Uh, he had been involved in some major transactions. Uh, his face had been in the New York Times a good deal. He was sort of a master of the universe uh, type. And so as we're approaching the table, I'm sticking my hand out, you know, to say, you know, with the intention of saying, hi, I'm Amor, we met once, you know, through your, your daughter. Um, and as I'm doing this, uh, somebody brushes past my shoulder, and it's a woman returning from the washroom, but it's not his wife. So I retract my hand very carefully. <laughs> now, he didn't make eye contact with me, but even if he had, he wouldn't know who I was. You know, I'm just one of a thousand of his kids' friends, right? So my, my wife is seated next to him, and I am seated next to this woman. And uh, we, the waiter tells us the specials, and my wife and I place our order. And in the meantime, presumably, this, this woman is gathering herself, uh, having been to the washroom, um, because she suddenly looks up and says, for seven years, you've been promising me that you're going to leave that woman. When are you going to do the right thing? And I'm like, oh, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> but sure enough, appetizer, entree, dessert, espresso, we hear the whole thing. <laughs> yeah. the, you know, the hotel rooms and the money and the religion and the kids and the waffling, you know, everything. So. And, and I'm like, happy anniversary, honey. You picked a perfect spot. Um, now, the, at the time, having re newly sort of arrived in New York City, what, what, what really struck me as so uh, um, sort of striking about this event was here's this guy um, who's obviously very sophisticated, intelligent, uh, you know, accomplished, presumably street savvy, sort of a Wall Street icon. Um, and somehow he had gotten it into his head that to go from you know, his apartment on, up in the, in the 80s in Central Park down to 15th Street, uh, that that was far enough to go to have lunch with his mistress while still being discreet about it. You know, I think this was kind of what he had in his mind. And I, and I, I kind of still thought that was sort of nutty at the time. But now having lived in New York for, for now almost half my life, uh, I, I've got to say that in retrospect, this is kind of interesting wisdom to this gentleman's perspective, I think. Because if you know the city, and I know most of the people in this room do, um, between 85th Street and 15th Street, there are actually 20 different microcosms. There are two block by two block neighborhoods that are narrowly defined around uh, ethnicity, religion, 
uh, social class, age group, lifestyle. Um, so for him, to sort of be looking out across Manhattan, he's going to uh, sort of uh, pass these 20 different microcosms. It's a little bit like crossing a little galaxy. And so it's sort of, sort of reasonable to assume that when you got to the other side of that, you shouldn't run into anybody you know. I think it's kind of the what was in the back of his mind he was thinking. Now, of course, this is why I tell this story in conjunction with the first, uh, which is that there am I, having just arrived in New York, and my neighbor, my immediate neighbor, are the Hells Angels. They, they controlled the entire brownstone. All the Harley Davidsons were lined out in front. And around the corner is this Orthodox Jewish community. Um, and I, I think you'd be hard-pressed to find two subsets of American society that are more radically different than those two. I mean, they are totally different in terms of their worldviews, in terms of uh, you know, their, their fashion, in terms of their food. Uh, the, the only thing that those two groups have in common are the beards. That's it. <laughs> but, uh, but there they are, coexisting right around the corner from each other, you know, giving each other, sort of nodding to them when they pass in the street, or you know, giving, you know, being sort of rough familiarity, abiding my existence as I kind of weave in and out of their two different populations. And this, of course, is one of the terrific things about uh, New York City, um, is that it is this, it's almost like a, a chessboard where each, uh, like in a chessboard, each square is radically different in color than what's next to it, you know, from red to black or white to black, however you want but, uh, and each of these little communities is coexisting right up next to each other um, in close proximity, giving the city its interesting social fabric. Now, uh, the city has been described as, as a, a melting pot, um, and of course it is a melting pot. It was a melting pot 100 years ago, it is today. Um, now when our high school teachers told us, you know, it's a melting pot, um, what they tended to mean was that it's a melting pot ethnically. Right? And we all know how that played out. At the end of the 19th century, uh, in the early 20th century, virtually all the tribes of Europe uh, sent some of their dispossessed across the ocean through Ellis Island they arrived in the you know, five boroughs, went and found the neighborhood where their countrymen had gathered, planted their own you know, flag, and began the great American experiment. You know, so without question, New York was uh, a melting pot at the time in ethnic terms, and continues to be. Um, but I, I think it's very interesting to note that for 100 years, New York City has also happened to be a melting pot of the passions. Now, now what I mean by that is that uh, New York City, for 100 years, has happened to be a significant capital of a wide array of human endeavors. Not necessarily the capital, but a very important capital. It is clearly, in America, a capital of food, of fashion, of finance. It's a, it's a capital of theater. It's a capital of architecture, of advertising, of printed and televised journalism. And I could go on. Um, and the side effect of taking this little plot of land and making it the capital of all these various human endeavors is that every year, 25-year-olds from around the country and to some degree from around the world come there to pursue their dream. And because of that incredible variety of actual pursuits, what you end up with is an array of these young people who are coexisting together, running into each other, spending time with each other. Because the individual who has come to go into the Goldman Sachs training program is radically different than the one who's coming to study with the Joffrey Ballet, who's radically different than the person who's coming to make it as a painter. And again, that adds an interesting aspect to the catalytic chemistry of being young in New York because they all intermingle. Um, and I'm going to come back to that point in a minute. Uh, now, in, in composing a novel... Uh, Inevitably, there are going to be influences that are very obvious to the author um, and that are pretty transparent to the reader as well. In the case of my novel, Rules of Civility, um, the photography of Walker Evans is a good example. It was an obvious influence to me in composing the book. It's obvious to those who read the book that, it's, that it serves as an influence. Jazz music would be another such case. Obvious to me, obvious to the reader. Um, but inevitably, in composing a book, there are going to be influences that are less obvious to you as a reader and may not be very obvious to me as the author either. And one such influence uh, 
in retrospect, uh, were the paintings of Edward Hopper. Now, I, I'm a, I've been a Hopper fan at different times of my life, and I wasn't really thinking about Hopper or his imagery at all when I was composing this book. Um, but when the book was kind of shipped off to the printer in my library, I happened to pull a, a collection of Hopper's paintings off my shelf, and I was kind of flipping through it, and I thought, oh, you know, this must have been in the back of my mind as I was inventing my version of this late 30s New York. Um, so what I want to do is I want to show you a couple of Hopper's paintings um, uh, to make some remarks about them, if you would bear with me. Um, all right, so here we go. Oh, wait, that's not Edward Hopper. That, that's my children. <laughs> How the hell did that get in there? I'm just kidding. It's in your, all right, here we go, though. Um, so the, the, the four paintings I'm going to show you, two of them are actually from basically 1938, uh, um, when my book takes place. My book takes place in the single year of 1938. It begins on New Year's Eve. It, it basically concludes on New Year's Eve going into 39. Two of the paintings are from that year. One is actually from a little bit earlier in, in the Depression, and one is uh, a, a few years later. But suffice to say that these paintings are all basically representative of, of Hopper's 1930s New York, and, and even more densely the, the period of my book. Um, now, the, the, the paintings I'm going to show you are going to share a couple of attributes that would be true to Hopper's work throughout his style, well, all the various things he painted, such as uh, the paintings are going to tend to have a pretty uh, narrow palette, by which I mean that uh, he's going to use only a few colors really to compose the majority of his scene. Uh, much as in here, you really have sort of the browns, the light blues, uh, the, the, the greens, a little bit of a splash of red and yellow, but, but really three colors are, are representing the majority of the canvas, um, and that's quite common in his work. Secondly, it's a pretty muted palette, meaning that if you look at those blues or, or greens, they're not the brightest uh, versions. It's kind of a softer uh, version of the colors. Um, you're going to tend to have in his paintings, these and others, these sort of angular shadows, like this one that's cutting across the carpet on the floor, coming down from the ceiling towards this older gentleman, which kind of give his paintings a little bit of the noirish uh, feel, um, and of course film noir is, is contemporary with Hopper's work, and, and, and those types of shadows were definitive in, in those works of film like, you know, uh, uh, Bogart in The Maltese Falcon, etc. Um, so as I say, uh, one other thing, it's pretty stripped clean. He, when he composed an environment, he tended to like take all the stuff out there that would have been there, anything, anything lying around, anything junk, anything extra furniture-wise, anything extra on the walls, it would, he would strip it out and you'd end up with a kind of a, a stripped down version of the space. Um, now as I say, those traits would be throughout his work. Um, what I want you to focus on though in the case of these four paintings are, um, are first of all, I'm gonna argue that these paintings are all kind of set in a twilight moment, meaning kind of, you know, in the evening. In the case of this painting, I'm gonna make that case uh, by this, this older couple who look like they're dressed for the theater or to go out for dinner. Um, this is obviously a, a lobby of a, of a small hotel uh, or, or apartment building. Um, so I want you to get that twilight sort of element is gonna repeat in these, in these paintings. But most importantly, I want you to focus on this young woman in the lower right-hand corner. The, the, the blonde and the blue dress. Um, there she is uh, sitting uh, uh, by herself um, in this lobby uh, with a downward gaze looking into the pages of her book. Here we have a, a painting of a commute. You know, again, you're going to have all those elements, the sort of narrow palette, the muted colors. The, again, but again, it's a twilight scene. If you look through that window on the train, you can see uh, sort of a sunset in the distance over that bridge. Um, but again, what we have here is a lone woman uh, with a downward gaze, uh, in this case, again, looking into the pages of her uh, book. Here's the third painting. Um, this is a uh, theater usherette. You can see the black and white movie projection over here on the left. Um, but again, okay, you know, sort of twilighty, I, I would think, in terms of timing. But again, what you have is this lone woman, um, again with a downward gaze, uh, in this case, just sort of looking down uh, towards the floor, uh, lost in thought uh, as the movie plays, because you gotta assume she's seen that movie a thousand times, right? Her busy moment is getting people seated and getting them out. This is her break, um, and there she is, sort of lost in thought. Finally. Here we have a, a cafe, uh, it's very much like what, what's one of the Italian-oriented cafes of Greenwich Village. Um, you can kind of see that from the, the round marble uh, top of the table. 
or even the, 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 what she's holding in her hand. Um, again, it's sort of a twilight or, or wee hour kind of moment. And again, we have a lone woman with a downward gaze, um, this time into her coffee cup. Now, I'm going to make sort of two observations that I think are kind of intriguing about this, this little series of paintings that he kept returning to over the course of the decade. And the first is, is um, I think it's, it's kind of fascinating uh, that he chose to depict New York in this fashion at all when you consider what New York was like in the 1930s. Because, you know, you want to keep in mind, of course, uh, that New York City in the 1930s, it's the Depression. The Depression begins in the fall of 1929 with the stock market crash, and it ends in 1939 with the, uh, with the march to war, the buildup of the economy leading up to the war. So as a decade, the 1930s is almost exactly bracketed by the beginning and the end of the Depression. And we know what, what the implications of that are. We've all can visualize that. It starts with people jumping you know, out of windows, uh, losses of fortunes, great and small, not every fortune, but you know, loss, significant loss of wealth for, for rich and middle class and lower class. Um, failure of banks uh, and the runs on banks. Bread lines, record unemployment. You also begin to get significant social unrest. Uh, the progress, uh, the, a very active period for the union movement in New York, gaining ground right through the 30s, major strikes in all the major cities in almost every major trade. Um, so this is without question, socioeconomically, a very turbulent decade, particularly in New York City. Um, but in addition, I want you to remember that this is the decade of boxing in Madison Square Garden. You know, this is the decade of swing music, really, or a significant part of the, uh, an important decade in swing music. And in this era, this is when the great swing bands, the big bands, most of them were based in New York City. They all played live before a, a youthful audience in a hotel bar, ballroom every Saturday night, and it was broadcast across the country. You know, Benny Goodman and his orchestra live from the Savoy Ballroom. You know, that was the scene where you could hear the people cheering and shouting in the background as they danced. Um, this is the era of uh, when you wanted real-time news, you would actually go to Times Square, because the New York Times was still based there at the time, and the New York Times would post the developments of significant stories as they gathered the information through their captive wire services, through their feet on the ground, um, and, that, and that was the, the, the best way to get the news. We have plenty of archival photographs of things uh, as simple as if the Yankees were in uh, the pennant race and were playing on the West Coast, um, the Times would post the score inning by inning, and in, a, in an important game, an elimination game, you could have 10,000, 20,000 people in Times Square watching the posting of the score with, all, with no other information, right? Um, so... My point, of course, being that not only is this a turbulent time for the city in socioeconomic uh, uh, terms, but it's just a boisterous, crowded, loud, bustling era for New York City. And Hopper, who's living there, is choosing to depict it in these very stripped down, serene, quiet moments. Now, I think that one reason why he kept returning to this particular image, this woman with the downward gaze, it's because he's putting his finger on an important paradox of the city that was true in 1930s and is true today, which is that as a young person in New York City, um, you go into public to get your privacy. Right? Because picture the lives of these young women in the 30s in New York City. Now, first of all, if you're a young woman in New York in the 1930s, 99% of the time, you're working class, you know, basically. Um, so you start your day, uh, if you're living at home, you're living with three generations, maybe four, in an apartment or half a house. Um, maybe you've gotten your act together, and like my narrator, Katie, you're living in a boarding house for girls. Um, so you've got a, a, a bedmate or roommate, um, but you're, you're sharing uh, a bathroom at the end of the hall with, with 15 or 20 other girls. And when you go down to breakfast, it's breakfast for 80. Right. And then uh, you go out the door, you go into the subway to go to work, and this is the era of the subway conductors who are, are the guys with the hats, whose little hats whose job is to shove you off the platform onto the train to get as many people onto the train before it leaves the station. So you get shoved in the car, there you are in the sardine can, you go off to work, and if you're like Katie, maybe you're in a, in a secretarial pool, you know, where there's you know, 15, 20 other girls uh, working on typewriters. Um, God forbid you're a seamstress. 
Because if you're a seamstress in this era, you're down in Soho in one of, you know, the third floor of a manufacturing loft building, no air conditioning in summer, no heat in winter, a hundred women all sitting in front of a Singer electric sewing machine going at full bore, you know, 10 hours a day, whatever it is for your shift. You know, these are the lives of these young women. And so if you wanted a moment to reflect, to consider your regrets, to, uh, to dwell on your, on your passions and romances, to imagine your future, just to let your mind wander, you'd go into public to do that. You'd go to the empty bench in Central Park. You know, you'd go, uh, you'd, 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 use to do, you'd commute in an off hour if you, if you had to. Um, you, you do what this young woman is doing and, and what young people have done for 100 years, which, you go, to a, which is you go to a cafe and you try to make a cappuccino last an hour and a half, <laughs> right? You know, I did that many, many da- days in the village, right? So, and you try to avoid the, idea, the eyes of the waiters. who are like, <laughs> buy something, please. So, but but this, this is the way it would happen. Now, um, an interesting thing about these four paintings, which had to be unconscious uh, by Hopper, is what I'm going to call the empty chair. So, you know, here, uh, right next to this, across from this young woman, you have this empty chair at her table, and you can almost see the edge of an empty chair over here to her left. It's dark, I know, but if you look right in front, at arm's length in front of this woman, these are all empty seats here at the bottom of the painting. There's sort of five empty seats in the movie theater. Here we obviously have the empty seat right to this woman's right, and across you can just see the edge. So there's actually nobody sitting opposite her. We can tell that from, from the, that, that little detail. And here again, we have this young woman. Yes, these older couples here, but you have an empty chair uh, next to her, an empty chair or two across from her. You can just barely see that there's a second chair there. And uh, the point I'd like to make is that if you are in this kinetic city with young people, with all, all these different sort of backgrounds, different personality types who've come together, and you go out into public to have your moment of privacy, wherever you do it, that empty chair is there. And inevitably what's going ha- inevitably what's going to happen is at some point in the next half hour, someone's going to take one of those chairs. And if you strike up a conversation with that person, um, because of the complex social fabric of, these, of the youth in the city, the one thing I can guarantee you is that person that you're talking to, the chances that they're just like you are zero, right? So, uh, and, and that is, is, adds to, to the power of some of the chance encounters that occur in the city. You can walk out your door thinking that your life looks a certain way, that you have a certain worldview. You can take such a seat, end up in such a conversation, and something about that conversation may begin to put your life in a new direction. Now, this, of course, is, is central, as a central theme in my book, um, which uh, opens on New Year's Eve with a uh, Katie, a, a working class, uh, a young one from a lurking, working class immigrant background, going out with her roommate, uh, they go to a low-rent jazz club in the village. A young man in a cashmere coat arrives and sits at the table next to them. His brother never arrives, so they sort of strike up a conversation. Um, and this chance encounter, sort of, they, they bandy about a bit. But ultimately, this chance encounter sets uh, their lives in, in, lays the foundation for their lives to go in totally new directions. You know, this is a central aspect of the book, not the only theme, but an important one. Um, so what I'd like to do is, is, uh, is read uh, two quick scenes uh, from the book, and then, then I'd, I'd love to take your questions, um, which, which to some degree are tied to this, this, this thematic element. Um, so you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to read something different. I take it back. I'm going to read you something new, because some of you have read the book. I don't want to read stuff you've already read, so, um, uh, but it's related to the book. As, as some of you know, when, when I finish this book, I, I really thank you. I, I didn't want to. Uh, I didn't want to write any more about Katie and Tinker, the two central characters, because really I felt that uh, everything that I was supposed to tell you about those two people is, you know, is here. It's here, and that were I to go and and tell you more, it would undermine this as a work of art. You know, everything that you, that I'm supposed to tell you is there. Everything else should be up to your imagination. Um, now that said, when I finished the book, what kept bugging me was, what's Eve doing in Hollywood? Eve is this troublemaking character in the book who uh, shoots off to Hollywood kind of without explanation, 
Um, and so I've written a novella that follows Eve to Hollywood. It begins with her on the train, and, and, and you know, 75 pages later, you kind of learn how, how she ends up in her life. Now, at, at the end of this book, one of the things that, that's mentioned is, is the main character, Katie, sees is, is handed a, 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 a tearing from a, a gossip magazine that shows that Eve, six months later, after going to Hollywood, is on the arm of, of Olivia de Havilland. Um, and so this novella kind of gets you from the train to that photograph. It kind of fills in the gaps, and it's going to be released as an ebook in July. Um, but I'm going to read—I'll read from that because it's kind of fun. It's—it's—it's it's, it's, it's different. So, so I'll just give you a quick setup, which is that in reality, Olivia, Olivia de Havilland, uh, she she was uh, she went to L.A. Um, around 1935-ish, around that time, um, and she was like 17 years old. She weighed 100 pounds. Um, and she ends up with a contract, and this, of course, is the great golden age of the studio system, which was almost indentured servitude for the actors and actresses at the time. Um, and uh, uh, she uh, was in 14 movies in three years. Right? You imagine what, how much, you know, just constantly at work. No choice in terms of the roles. It was entirely up to Jack Warner, who held her contract. Um, and actually, uh, for... Um, uh, it was, it was for Captain Blood, I think, with Errol Flynn. Uh, the director felt that her smile uh, wasn't endearing enough, and she was forced to have her teeth pulled at her own expense. Again, to give you a sense of, of Hollywood at the time. Um, but at any rate, so uh, what's happening in the case, this is I want to read to you from the middle of this, this, this little novella, which is actually six different short stories told from six different perspectives. In the middle is, is a story told from Olivia de Havilland's perspective. This young woman... Um, and, and what's happened at the end of 1938 is that, uh, the, in true life, the great uh, bestseller, Gone with the Wind, has been purchased um, uh, by, by Selznick and company. And uh, the director, George Cooker, has uh, realized that the perfect person to play Melanie, sort of the soft counterpart to Scarlett O'Hara, is Olivia de Havilland. She was the, one of the most de de naturally demure figures in Hollywood, um, but Jack Warner wouldn't let her do it. He was kind of mad that Selznick had gotten the book, uh, and he didn't like to set a precedent of having his actors work in other studios, so he refused. Um, and uh, Cougar says, well, listen, why don't you come read for the part in secrecy? Come to my house uh, on a Sunday, um, and she, she initially says she's not going to do that. Um, and on this night, she's met Eve by chance, um, and she, Eve has sort of learned this story, and, and Eve is on her way to go uh, because somebody has told her that the, 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 the best donuts in California are on the, the amusement park uh, of the, the Santa Monica Piers, which were all amusement parks at the time. And so she convinces Olivia to go with her, and, and this is uh, having heard that story. Um, so this is them arriving at the, at the Santa Monica Pier as kind of the end of this Olivia de Havilland short story. So bear with me. Stretching a hundred yards into the sea, the Santa Monica piers were crowded with all manner of amusements. There were tin rifle ranges where brand new recruits in freshly pressed uniforms tested their aim, and rainbow colored wheels of fortune, 10 feet in diameter, surrounded by Mexican grandmothers who crossed themselves at every turn. Polishing off their flask of gin and ditching their shoes in the sand, Eve and Olivia sallied forth into the carnival beckoned by the calls of the barkers and the rumble of the roller coaster and the shouts of children out past their bedtimes. It didn't take long for them to find the fabled purveyor of donuts, standing proudly under a green and white canopy. While Eve paid for their order, order Olivia watched the freshly fried donuts riding the small conveyor until they dropped into the sugar pan one by one, and she was suddenly struck by how hungry she was. It was the hunger of a lifetime of half-finished dinners and half-finished cigarettes. So when Eve pulled the first of the donuts from the bag, Olivia grabbed it like an urchin from the streets. Her mother would have been mortified by her behavior, of course. But what a donut it was. A confection of contrasts, of contradictions. First came the exterior, hot, crusty, coated with a sugar grit. But then this golden brown sensation was followed almost impossibly by the cool smoothness of the jelly. You could tell it wasn't raspberry or strawberry, and that was the genius of it. It was just r sweet and red, a 
A finer preserve would have ruined the whole sensation. When Olivia took her second bite, she could feel a glob of the jelly running down her chin. That, said Eve, is the first real smile I've seen on you all night. As the two of them continued down the pier, the autumn wind seemed to be gaining force, pulling carnations from lapels and ribbons from pigtails. Grabbing Eve's elbow, Olivia pointed as a fine yellow hat blew off the head of a negress. Her boyfriend gave honorable chase. But when the hat lofted out to sea, he took his own hat from his head and spun it like a discus into the dark. The wind, said Eve. It's incredible. It's the Santa Ana, Olivia explained. It comes every autumn. From where? Well, from all the talk. <laughs> Eve laughed. You mean from all the gossip. And the auditions and directions and negotiations, said Olivia. From the heart-crossed promises, Olivia thought, and the heartfelt excuses, too. All those voices rising from Burbank and Beverly Hills like a tide until they breached some invisible barrier and flooded toward the sea, threatening to tear up palm trees and personas and the best laid plans in their wake. Now it was Eve who reached for Olivia's elbow. A few steps away was an elaborate contraption, a machine that looked like a cross between a fire engine and a, a calliope and half the technological advances of the 20th century. It had pistons like you'd see on a locomotive, the dials and meters of a furnace, an elaborate system of egg beaters. There were multicolored pinwheels and whistles and the horn of a gramophone mounted on a pole. <clears throat> Standing before it was a little man with the beard and pince-nez of Toulouse-Lautrec. Eve popped the last bite of donut into her mouth and wiped the sugar from her hands. So what's this all about? This? The man repeated, why this is the Astrologicon. The three of them surveyed it together. You will note, the little man continued, that I said thee instead of Anne, for it is the only one of its kind in the world. He explained this somewhat sadly, as if he were speaking of the very last of a fantastic species like the unicorn or chimera. But what does it do? asked Olivia. Ah, he said, what does it do? With three fingers and a thumb, he sharpened the point of his beard. Once in possession of five essential attributes of a homo sapiens, the astrologicon will consult the tomes of history, the laws of chemistry, and the arrangement of the stars in order to provide an unassailable, incontrovertible, and indismissible instruction for one dollar. Let's to it, said Eve. The proprietor accepted Eve's payment and placed it with ceremony in a small tin box. Then he proceeded to collect the essential attributes of her person and to calibrate the contraption accordingly. He punched the letters of her name into a panel of dislodged typewriter keys. He set three adjacent dials to the year, month, and date of her birth. He took a fingerprint. He turned an arrow embedded in a spectrum of colors to the price, precise pigmentation of her eyes. And finally, he handed Eve the end of a stethoscope, which was cabled back into the inner workings of the machine. If you would be so kind, he said, pointing shyly towards her sternum. Eve slid the stethoscope under the neckline of her dress, and you could suddenly hear the beating of her heart broadcast through the gramophone's horn overhead. As Eve and Olivia realized what they were hearing, the tempo of Eve's heartbeat increased. But closing her eyes, Eve exhaled and inhaled and exhaled again until her heartbeat subsided to the tempo of the waves beneath the pier. The proprietor nodded in sober appreciation. Then after reclaiming the stethoscope, he reached into his watch pocket and produced a hexagon of brass. I caution you, young lady, that the astrologicon is not to be taken lightly. I suspect the path of your life appears clearly before you, a path which in all probability is popular, convenient, and profitable. But the astrologicon cares nothing for these things. Rather, like the oracle at Delphi, it will advise you to do what you should 
regardless of opinion, difficulty, and cost. He handed the hexagon to Eve and gestured to a slot in the machine marked by four converging arrows. Then he put his hands together and bowed. Without a moment's hesitation, Eve dropped the token in the slot. There was a buzz followed by a whir. The needles on the temperature gauges began to climb, and after a blast of steam, the axles of the engine set in motion the pistons and pinwheels. The proprietor led them down the length of the machine, pointing to each kinetic phase, to the interpolator and the centrifuge and the epistemologue, until with the ring of a desk clerk's bell, an envelope fell into a sterling silver toast caddy. The envelope was addressed in fine calligraphy to Evelyn Ross, November 5th, 1938. Eve thanked the proprietor. Then she led Olivia to an, over, sorry, to an uncrowded spot under a lamppost, and she placed the envelope in Olivia's hand. Livy, whatever this says, I think you should follow it to the letter. Olivia didn't smile at the suggestion. She only nodded and closed her fingers around the envelope. Then the two continued their prog progress past the roller coaster toward the very end of the pier, where they could now see the ocean-going casinos bobbing outside the city limits. And it felt to Olivia as if the continent was being tilted and all of California was going to slip into the sea. And though she couldn't remember the exact reference and whether it was from mythology or the Bible, she knew instinctively as they approached the pier's limit that she mustn't look back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So with that, uh, <laughs> I'm happy to take any of your questions about anything. <laughs> the, the question is what prompted me to write a book set in the late 30s. Um, uh, the, the, a very practical reason is that the origin of, of my book, which I think most readers would guess, uh, were, were the Walker Evans photographs that are in the book. Uh, Walker Evans, the great American photographer, who's really known for uh, sort of rundown rural photographs of the Depression. You know, those beautiful pictures of, of, of old weathered signs and tilting houses and women in gingham dresses. Um, he lived in New York City in the late 30s and he rode the subways with a hidden camera taking portraits of whoever was sitting across from him. He took 500 of these portraits. And, uh, but he felt he'd invaded the privacy of uh, the people, so he wouldn't show them. And in 1966, the Museum of Modern Art approached him and said, how about now? So in 66, those photographs were shown for the first time. And uh, I was going through those pictures knowing their history. And uh, I, as I was going through them, I thought, wouldn't it be amazing if somebody at that opening in 1966 at MoMA recognized a friend from their youth? And I kept going through the pictures and I thought, oh, even better. What if the person recognized the same friend in two photographs, but the friend had undergone such a transformation between photograph in one and photograph two that she's the only one in the room who can tell it's the same person? And that's what I wrote down on a piece of paper, like, idea for a book. Oh, you know. And I, I've written since I was a kid, but, but I, I, I came up with that idea when I was about 25, and then I wrote it when I was about 45. But so that took me back to 1938 by necessity, but certainly... Uh, I, I, I was interested in that project partly because I think the time is so fascinating. I think it's a lot of fun. And I've implied this a little bit, but I'll just elaborate. One aspect of it is that, having said the 1938, you know, we, 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 or the 30s, is this incredible decade of social upheaval and, you know, the depression and the bread lines and the banks and all that. Well, the 1930s is also the decade in which Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers made all of their movies. You know, as I said a minute ago, it was an extremely important decade in the development of swing music. It is the decade in which the Marx Brothers made all of their important films. It's the decade in which Rockefeller Center was built, almost exactly the entire decade it took to do it. But if you think of it, I like to think of if you found somebody in outer space and you said, all right, I'm going to give you, a, you know, four artifacts for you to interpret a decade on Earth in America. And I gave him, you know, Rockefeller Center with its soaring architecture and, you know, great deco statues or 
you know, the swing music of Benny Goodman and, you know, Night at the Opera with, with the Marx Brothers and, you know, Top Hat with Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers. There's no way they'd come up with the Depression as the decade that created all that stuff. You know, so I think there's this very interesting aspect of the Depression, which is that naturally, you know, in high school, you're sort of given the, 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 the tougher part of that decade. It's a very important part of the decade. But the decade was, was more multifaceted and complex than that. And I kind of, it was sort of an interesting period to investigate for that reason. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I'm not really very interested in mining my own experiences. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, I never, I never, uh, I, I, it was, it was from a woman's perspective on the first day, and I never second guessed that. But I, I, you know, I, I come from, I suppose, the the tradition, the narrative tradition, uh, which you know, you go back to Shakespeare and. Um, you know, I think it was intrinsic to the, the serious narrative serious narrative writing, starting you know right with Shakespeare, that the job of the serious narrative writer was to create an array of three dimensional psychologies, uh, to put them in a context, and to allow those psychologies to interact. Each psychology with its own failings and contradictions, and you know impulsive actions and and, and, and conflicted. Uh, concerns and responsibilities, each one, that you let them interact, and it's through that that we begin to have a, a sense of the human condition. Um, but now, very famously, the reason that Shakespeare was so good at achieving what I just described is that we don't know who he is. I mean, or, 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 it's not because of that, but it's related. I mean, there is no Shakespeare in the Shakespearean plays. There's no real serious critical tradition that says, okay, he, that's, you know, Hamlet is Shakespeare. Well, what about Falstaff? You know, what about, you know, so... so uh, but it's because he's removed himself, he's creating these people. And, um, and I think that this was the mission of serious narrative writing for hundreds of years in the, in the, in the sort of the golden age of the novel in America. You see it, uh, or, 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 or in English, you see it in you know, uh, Virginia Woolf. Her most important book, arguably, is Mrs. Dalloway. And it is told from the perspective of uh, an aging socialite, Mrs. Dalloway, but also from a young veteran returned from the First World War who's on the verge of committing suicide. And the book goes back and forth from their, to their experiences and changes tone uh, as you go. Faulkner, most important books are As I Lay Dying and Sound of the Fury, arguably. Both of them are told from male and female perspectives going back and forth. Um, and I think that sort of this interesting thing happened in, in our generation, which is that in the 1970s, there was incredible development in American letters, which is that the canon got blown open. You know, canon, meaning the, 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 the collection of books that we think of as, as the most important in our cultural history, um, largely white and male, you know, pre-60s. 60s, suddenly there's African-American male writing, which is, which is really, uh, uh, you know, welcomed by, uh, uh, the, by the readership, by the publishing industry, by critics. And then in rapid fire, it's African-American female writers like Toni Morrison and Alice Walker. And then it's Asian-American female writers like Maxine Hong Kingston and Amy Tan. It's Louise Erdrich writing about the lives of, of, of Native Americans on, on the reservations in the 60s and 70s and 80s. It's gay writing. It's urban writing. You know? uh, and so suddenly, I think there was this, this, this explosion was very good for American letters, of course, because it introduced all these new voices, styles, concerns into what we think of as important literature. Um, but a side effect of this, I think, is that we as a generation began to assume that a serious book should be written from the perspective of the author. But for hundreds of years, that would not have been the assumption. Yes, all the way in the corner. The question is about the rules of civility. Uh, for those who have not read it, um, the Rules of Civility literally refers to a list that George Washington uh, transcribed as a young teenager of 110 rules of, of manners and ethics that he wanted to, that he aspired to live by. Um, and this list plays a, a part in my book. More importantly, my book is, is, it would be accurately described at least to some degree as a novel of manners. All the characters are modifying their behavior to some degree to make an impression of a particular kind, depending on who they're with and what they're trying to achieve. And, and the book traces that. And, and so the idea that George Washington created this sort of list as a young man of, of, of you know, this is how one should behave, I think is so fascinating and fantastic. Um, but I, I think a very important aspect of, of that list, or it's kind of intriguing, I guess, aspect, is that 
He, he didn't invent the list. He, that list was uh, he inheriting that uh, um, as all the founding fathers were very concerned with the exact same idea. Franklin, Jefferson, you know, uh, not Hamilton so much, but the others were very focused on, you know, on how do I be the, you know, a, a good, uh, a tr a true man, a gentleman or what have you. Well, an interesting thing about that list, as I was about to say, is that it is, it is a mix, and it's at the back of the novel uh, in its entirety. Um, it is a mix of what today we would consider rules of manners. You know, don't talk with your mouth full. You know, hold a door open for someone who's older than you. You know, that kind of thing. Um, but also with rules that we would consider rules of morals. You know, to be honest, to be true to your conscience. Now, the reason I think it's intriguing from today's perspective is that, again, for hundreds of years, there would have been no distinction between those two things in educated society. And it goes all the way back to the age of chivalry. If you were a knight in King Arthur's court or what have you, um, and you, you were lived by the rules of chivalry, the rules of chivalry included rules of manners, because you were expected to comport yourself well at court, and before a lady or before the king. But obviously it also had rules of, of morals. You would die for the country or for your king. You would never lie or steal. You would save uh, an innocent person who was in distress. You know, but there was no distinction in the eyes of the knight. Right? The code of chivalry included both. To be a knight, you had to do both of those things. Comport yourself well at court and do the right thing in the field of action. Now that actually goes right down through the centuries towards the present. You know, ultimately it's, it's, uh, it's there in the ideas of Vertu in the Renaissance. In, in the 19th century, it survives in England and, and other European countries as a gentleman, you know, in essence. The gentleman of, you know, mid 19th century England or Italy was someone who knew how to behave in polite society and did the right thing, no distinction. You could not be a gentleman and do half of that. And it's sort of a more modern idea that we kind of split these apart. You know, uh, so the book also kind of looks at that. You know, where, where does the sort of the behavioral side of mannerisms sort of, and the, the more moral side, where do they com come into conflict or veer apart? You know, that's an aspect of the book. Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, I do. I, I'm in a, a book club that we're, we're approaching our 10th year, uh, roughly. Um, it's four of us, two men, two women. We're all married, but our spouses are not, don't participate. Um, <laughs> and we, we, we launched, uh, we launched, uh, really, I, I, the, I, it came about because um, when I was turning 40, I was reading Harold Bloom's book, which is called roughly, Where Do We Find Wisdom? And he, Harold Bloom, late in his life, this terrific Yale uh, cultural critic, uh, literary critic, uh, has been writing a series of books where he looks back over everything he's read, and he's read everything. Sort of, he's, he's judging what he's read and why. And, and in this particular book, his question he asks himself is, where did I find wisdom? And the book, uh, wisdom for him, a little bit like I was saying a minute ago with Shakespeare, is, 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 is having a command of the human condition. You know, that's, that's wisdom, understanding it or, or grappling with it, having insights into it. Um, and so he, he does these comparisons. He says, okay, uh, uh, Plato or Homer? In retrospect, you know, I'm 80, which one gave me more wisdom? And he, he's a great Platonist, loves Plato, Socrates. But he's like, oh, I gotta, it's Homer. You know, I learned more from the Odyssey and the Iliad without question than any of the dialogues of, of Plato. Um, and he keeps moving, and, and he does uh, Freud and Proust. You know, he's moving chronologically. He's a huge Freudian, full, enormous fan of Freud. But he's like, you know what? It's Proust. It's not Freud. You know, because they're contemporaries, reading remembrance of things past, whatever. And I, so I was reading this, and I thought, you know, wow. I, 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 for 21 years, I was in the investment business. I recently retired. But, but so at the time, you know, I had a full-time job. I write fiction. I've got kids. Uh, and, I, and I was thinking, I'm, I'm lucky if I can read one book a month in depth. I mean, to read it with a pen, to think about it, Maybe to write down some of my thoughts about it, talk about it with somebody seriously. You know, one book a month, that's, that would be great. Well, at 40, if I live till 80, you know, that means I got 480 books left, right? So I was a little daunted by that notion. And I thought, uh, you know what, for, for a while at least, I'm gonna, I want to read books that the, the test for me became, I want to read a book that would merit being read several times in my life, that it would mean something different at the age of 20, at 40, at 60. It would still interest me, entertain me, and yet I would see it in a new and refreshing way. 
which is another way of saying a book that survives time and, you know, and has depth. Um, so I was saying this to a close friend of mine, and she was like, I'm, where do I sign up? I want to go. Let's do it. I'm in it. You know, let's do it. So, so we started with Remembrance of Things Past, and we read it, you know, the seven volumes over the course of about a year and a half. And then we began moving on to new projects, and we've done a variety of, of projects. Each project might take us a half a year to a year and a half. But um, currently, our project, which has been fun, is we went back and looked at those who won the Nobel Prize in Literature in the last 30 years. And the nature of the Nobel Prize in Literature is that it's given for a life's work, not for a book. Right? The Pulitzer is given for a book. You win the Nobel Prize in Literature for you know, 10 books, 20 books. Um, so it's clearly substantial writers. And if you go back and look at the last 25 years, my guess is, and I, I have a graduate degree in literature, uh, I, I recognize, I don't know, maybe seven out of 25 recognized. You know? And it's, it's, a, it's a Japanese writer, it's a Chinese writer, it's a, you know, a, a West African writer, it's a Caribbean writer, it's, you know, it's a Polish writer. Um, which is, and so we thought, let's go back and do them. So we're, we're doing uh, winners of the Nobel Prize in literature from outside the United States we read three books, and if we love it, we move, you know, keep going, four, five, six. And if we're done with the three books, we move on to the next guy. So we just finished Ma, uh, Nagub, Nagub Mahfouz, the first person who won the uh, Nobel Prize in Literature for writing in Arabic. It's based, in a way, he's like the first novelist in Arabic, because nobody wrote in novels in Arabic pre-1900. Nobody did. Um, anyway, so that's what we're, like, we're doing that right now. I know. Yes. The, the, the question is, is how did I become an investment banker? Um, <laughs> I, I, I was in the investment management business, which is a little bit different than investment banker, but, but same, th same question. Um, I was both by chance and necessity. I mean, I was 25 years old. I was living in New York. I was writing, but I needed to make money. I was a little sick of being by myself all day, too. So I joined a friend of mine who was starting an investment firm. It's a research-driven field, so it's very intellectually stimulating. And you know, 21 years later, we still had offices next to each other. You know, and uh, until this January, when I said, you know, I think I'm done. <laughs> but uh, but it was so it was it was it was it's, it was by chance. But it, you know, it was it's good. It was nice to have a profession. Yes. It, the question is, has the book been optioned for film? And the answer is yes. I, I, I was approached by people really right from the time it was published. And in October of 2011, having met with a bunch of people, I said, you know what? I'm not going to make a decision until October of 2012. And I told William Morris that. I was like, take any, I'll meet with anybody who wants to meet with me about it, but I tell them I'm not making a decision. Because that whole industry is very geared around they want to get you to lunch, and then they want you to make a decision to choose them in the next five days. You know, like, you know, it's all around this thing. And I was like, so tell them, that's not going to happen. So I continue, people continue to kind of meet with me and whatever. And, and uh, in the end, um, uh, the su last summer, I, the president of Lionsgate uh, came to see me in New York and was terrific. And I had a great sort of uh, affinity to the book for very interesting reasons. So I optioned the book to Lionsgate in the fall. Now, Lionsgate made the Twilight movies and the Hunger Games movies, <laughs> which means they got a lot of money <laughs> to make movies. But it also means they're kind of untested in, in, the, uh, uh, in, in translating a work of fiction into, into a more adult format. But that's one of the reasons they approach me, is they're very eager to do that. Um, and uh, they, we, we, we recently, they, he gave me a lot of uh, interesting authority. I have the right to approve the director. I was involved in approving the screenwriters. Um, uh, and we just hired the screenwriters recently, and they're two terrific guys who made a, a movie called 500 Days of Summer, they, they wrote, which is kind of like the, the Woody Allen of, uh, the Annie Hall of, of the current generation in terms of, the, of the, its structure, its tone. They're, they're great writers, and, and they had found the book on their own and approached uh, saying, you know, we're fans of the book, we'd love to do this. And so, so from here, we then choose the director, and things start to then move forward. But it, can ne it may never come out. You never know. Hollywood's crazy. You want to play the I, I, you know, I don't really know who the 25-year-old actors are. <laughs> All, almost, almost every character in the book is 25 years old. I have no idea who they are. So, so. Do I want to be in a cameo? No, I, no I, I don't need to be in a cameo. Yes? Not really. <laughs> no, she doesn't. 
Um, she re- she reads my stuff, but she's uh, she's not. It's it's not her her bag. Um, she maybe she's too generous with me or whatever. But you need to be pretty critical to be a good editor, and and so. Uh, um, but I, I, what I do is my process is that once I have a manuscript that I really like, I mean, and I've worked through it several times probably, uh, I like to share it with five people at the, in a 30-day in period. You know, so what I'll do is I'll give it to five friends who are serious readers of different kinds, and, and I'll set up a lunch date with each of them 30 days from now, you know, 30, 32, 34 days, because um, I want to hear their feedback in quick succession. And, 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 uh, and I, I, five is good. You know, two is too few, ten is too many. You're looking for, for some kind of insight into a potential structural weakness in the book. Everybody's got their likes this and don't like that, and that's, why, that's not helpful. So, you know, an example, uh, at the end of the first real finished draft, I, I wrote this book in a year. I set myself the goal of writing the first draft in 12 months, which I did. I started on New Year's Day. 2006, which is why the book begins on New Year's Eve. It ended on New Year's Eve that year. Um, the book has 26 chapters because there's 52 weeks in a year. And I wanted to write a chapter for a week, edit it for a week, and then move on. So once I had the manuscript, I then revised that and then shared it with my five, with five readers. And it sort of, sort of give you a feel for what you're looking for. Um, it, you're, it, it was... You, one of the people, one of my friends, or one of the readers, was very worried that the summer was slow. It was dull. A lot, I, was beginning, I was running the risk of losing interest in the book. Somebody else said, um, you know, this, this Tinker, Eve, Katie triangle is so fascinating, but very early in the book, you know, Eve and, and Tinker go to the Mediterranean, and suddenly, you know, Katie's all by herself, and they're gone too long. You got to bring them back. Somebody else said, uh, I don't understand what Katie's doing you know, uh, about her career. I don't really understand why she quit her job and what she's looking for in life. I got confused with where she's going. And for those of you who've read the book, uh, I invent, uh, you, go, you go back and you think about those things, and I was like, you know what? There's something in common with these three very different observations. You're trying to find a change to the book that would solve all three of those problems at once. That's the nature of economy. So uh, I invented Mason Tate. You know, Mason Tate is, is, is Katie right in the beginning of the summer, ends up going to work for this very driven, idiosyncratic, ambitious guy who's launching sort of the equivalent of New York Magazine. And what it does is simultaneously, it it sort of speeds the pace of the summer, because she's sort of this professional. It gives a sense of her longer-term direction, and you're less worried about where Eve and Tinker are because of it. You see what I mean? So you're, as I say, your goal is to sort of mull over concerns, but then try to improve the book in a very succinct way that that would solve all the problems. Yes? When you mentioned how there were books that you couldn't read over and you could change it, this book could be read by my daughter. Yeah. Into a book that's all gazing down into their problems. Yeah. Then it was partly because of how it is that I can't keep working. Yeah. Oh, you're, you're nice. I mean, the, the, the observation is that, that she feels that she and her daughter can both read this book. I, I like to think that the book is is can mean something different to a 25-year-old, a 50-year-old, and a 75-year-old. And, and uh, you know, and, and that's, you know, that, so I appreciate you saying that. That's, you're, you're trying to build something, not, not for economic reasons, not so that it'll have more customers, you know, but, but it's, 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 a, it's a window on the fact that you have sketched life well enough um, that these different people can relate to it in a, in, a, in a way that matters to them. And they can access the characters and you know visualize the scenes and all those kinds of things too, um, but uh, so th- but I appreciate that. Yes. Ah, uh, do I write every day? Um, I you know um, well when I had it so so I, this book no, because I had a full time job. So, you know, my, my pattern of behavior was much more built around the, uh, uh, a, a, this has changed a little bit because now I have, now I kind of write almost every day. And how do you start that? How do you, how do you program your writing in terms of time? I'm a, well, I'm a very aggressive user of outlines. So, I mean, I, 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 I design this book in detail in advance. Every chapter, every character, every event, and even had written paragraphs to sort of, get, to sort of give me a sense of what is this chapter going to sound like, let's say or this person, or, or whatever. 
Um, and, and then I work kind of very manual laborish off of that outline. Um, you know, that's, that's, that's the effective means for me. Yes? I wrote a book in my mid-30s to early 40s. It took me seven years to write it, and I didn't like it at the end, and I set that aside. And so that is in a drawer where it will remain. <laughs> <laughs> but but I, you know, having, ju having just made this sort of flip remark about outlining, I did not outline that book. I did not invent the characters carefully in advance. And I did not give myself a very tight writing schedule. And seven years later, it didn't work. So it's part of the reason I decided to really to, to outline more aggressively and then to, to work with a shorter time frame. And the reason I decided to work with a shorter time frame for first draft, because having wrote, written this book in a year, I then rewrote it three times over three years. But, but not, that's what you read. But, but the reason is because in reviewing that failed manuscript, um, my favorite parts were paragraphs that I had written in the first year never changed. And there were paragraphs I've been working on for seven years that I still hated. So there, you know, there's something about that, that, that freshness of that early stage of invention that, it, that it, it, can it can be very powerful in terms of giving you the right tone, word choice, style, and labor, laboring over something can be very dangerous. Take the life out of, out of the book. You have to be careful with that in the editing process too. Yes. I am having just finished recently this novella that, that, you know, that I read from. It'll be, as I say, published in June. Uh, I, I uh, t three weeks ago started a new novel, and I'll, hopefully I'll draft it over the course of, of a year. But again, that'll take me probably three or four years to get to you. Well, I'll tell you one other story. Uh, you've been generous with your time. Um, I, I, you know, there, there, nothing in this book is. Only two things in this book are from real life. The book is an invention. Many of the places are made up, and the, in, in, all the events are made up. The people are made up. Um, but an important influence for me in, in the, I guess, I suppose in retrospect, in, in, in building this, this story, um, an important influence was, was my grandmother on my maternal side. Uh, both of my grandmothers lived to about 100, and, uh, which is terrific fun because it means, you know, at the age of 30, I could still, I was, I was having lunch with them um, as an adult, you know, so I knew them as an adult. Um, and my, my grandmother, who on the maternal side was sort of an aristocrat from Boston, and uh, she was the one who really gave me the sense that the women who came of age with her in the 1920s and 30s were less Victorian than the women who came of age with my mother in the 1950s and early 60s. It's a sort of interesting paradox in the role that women have played in American society in this century. The 1920s and 30s was a very bold time for women, essence, in essence, in public. Um, you know, this is the era of Amelia Earhart, you know, cutting her hair short, wearing pants, solo flying a plane across the Atlantic. You know, uh, it's the era of Eleanor Roosevelt speaking for the White House. You know, because with, with, with Franklin in a chair, in the wheelchair, uh, Eleanor was, was a, a, a spokesperson of policy. You know, and it's kind of, a, and was a great hero in the country, an effective one. It's kind of amazing when you think of like me coming of age where, you know, when, when Bill Clinton was elected, you remember Hillary was sitting in the healthcare uh, uh, meetings, which her background was healthcare law, and uh, there was a hue and cry across the nation. What is she doing in those meetings? She's not an elected official. Is she going to be pushing the button on the bomb? And they, they had remember they had to pull her out of the meetings. They cut her hair. They changed her clothes, and she was she was reading to kindergartners like that. You know, <laughs> you know and, and 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 you know now and now she, and then she was the Secretary of State. You know, I mean, like you know, t t twenty years later, whatever it is, fifteen years later. But but yes, there was this sort of. The 1950s, you know, I grew up in the era of June Cleaver, you know, and father knows best, leave it to Beaver, and, and you know, mom, at uh, five o'clock, you know, greets dad at door, takes briefcase, hands martini in an apron, food is on the table, the kids are, you know, neat, the house is clean, whatever. You know, that's an invention of the 1950s. You know, my grandmother would no sooner have done that than jumped off a building. But, so, so, so she kind of gave me this sense of, uh, of a sort of very different type of, of, of sort of public visage of, of, of of women, young women in America, and um, and anyway, she, she didn't get married till she was 30, and she'd been proposed to a bunch of times, including several times with my grandfather. And uh, actually, uh, there they are, that's them. And that's around that time, um, uh, so that's my grandmother obviously on the left. Um, so my, my grandfather had proposed a couple of times, she said, no, 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 I'm not interested. And a whole bunch of them got together and they were at this party on the, on the shore and oh, for a weekend. And uh, my, my grandmother notices sort of early in this weekend that there's a new 
you know, member of the social circle who's a blonde, who's kind of making, you know, chatting up my grandfather, you know, on Friday night and everything, and kind of, you know, talking and making eyes at him. My grandmother's kind of watching this from across the room. So Saturday night, this sort of the big cocktail party out on the dock, this blonde shows up at the cocktail party in summer in white furs and makes a beeline for my grandfather. So my grandmother kind of follows her out on the dock, and she gets up right next to her, and she gives her one of these and knocks her into the ocean in her furs. Oh, no. which, which my character does in the book. It's one of the two things from real life that happened in my book. But so, uh, and, and my, my grandmother then says, she tells me this story, and she says, and that's when I decided to marry your grandfather. Because <laughs> this is the way that grown-ups make decisions, right? So... But uh, so, so in, 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 19, in 1989, when I, when I moved to New York, my sister followed me about a year later, my younger sister. And she began dating a buddy of mine, that I, a friend I'd made, met in New York. And they decided to move in together. You know, my sister was probably 24 or 5. And uh, so my mother and her sisters are all, you know, how are we going to tell grandma that, you know, Kimbrough is moving in with Daniel, they're not even engaged. You know, we, we should get her a post office box so that grandma won't know where the mail is going. You know, it's ridiculous. <laughs> So my, my sister says, you know, I'm not going to lie to grandma. You know, mom, aunts, I'm not lying to grandma. So she sits my grandmother down and she says, grandma, you know, you've met Dan. Uh, we're very much in love and we're moving in together and it's terrific. And my grandmother is visibly upset. And so my sister starts to back, you know, pedal. Oh, uh, you know, it's the times have changed. We're trying to save money, you know. And my grandmother says, no, 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 Kimbro." Kimbro, that's not it at all. She says, the reason I'm upset is that if you move in with Daniel, how are you going to see other men? <laughs> and my mother goes, oh! You know, like this. Anyway, thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate it.